if you were trapped in a massive corn maze with a group of deadly killers hunting you down, what would you do? These psychos won't stop until they skin you alive, so I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the skin harvesters in Fear Farm. This college student is going to have his flesh carved from his body. Brandon here is relaxing in his room and texting his girlfriend when he starts to get in the mood. Reaching for his bottle of lotion, he knocks it off his bedside table and tries to grab it, but suddenly a hand latches onto his wrist from underneath his bed. Terrified, he jumps back in fear and is relieved to see that it was his girlfriend, Wendy. She was hiding there the entire time and teases him, asking what he was about to do, but the guy brushes her off. Brandon is more interested in seeing her take off the cheerleading uniform, and the girl pushes him onto the bed, but before they get too far, his mom barges into the room. Panicking, they quickly stop what they're doing as the college student demands to know why she's here. The woman explains that his friends have arrived, and this guy Rustin comes into the room, teasing the couple that their moment was interrupted. His sister Melody joins them on the bed, and as Wendy is showing her a video, it's interrupted by a commercial advertising a horror-themed corn maze called the Fear Farm. The girl insists they try it out since they're always doing the same thing all the time, but Rustin refuses to go. The others ask him why, and he explains that people were killed there. It sounds ridiculous, but the guy reveals that 50 years ago, a satanic cult sacrificed a girl, and when the police arrived, all they found was a flap of skin that was peeled off her body. The sister Melanie insists they all go, and reluctantly, her brother agrees. They all leave the house and get into Rustin's car. To their surprise, his sister tucks a knife into her shoe and explains it's for her own protection. It's a smart idea, and the group heads out to the corn maze, with no idea that they'll be hunted down by eight vicious killers. Arriving at the fear farm, they walk towards the entrance where a staff member warns the guests to turn on their cell phones before entering the venue, and they'll each be stamped for their security. Heading into the maze, the friends are checked for their stamps when suddenly Melanie sets off an alarm and notices that her stamp is different from the others. Confused, she goes back to the staff member asking him what's going on, and he explains that this stamp is only given to the lucky 10,000th visitor. That means she has exclusive access to the VIP maze, and a man suddenly drives up in his truck. Getting out of the vehicle, Herschel here introduces himself as the owner of the fear farm, and the blonde asks him what's so special about the VIP experience. The man quickly explains that the VIP maze is special, and invites them all to take part, promising to give them $5,000 if they finish in two hours. It sounds unbelievable, but the man ups the ante, insisting he'll award them $10,000 if they finish in under an hour. Shocked, the group quickly agrees to take him up on his offer and have no idea this was their biggest mistake. Okay, this is already a terrible idea. The group already knows the story that a satanic cult killed someone on this property 15 years ago, and since this place is clearly a family farm, there's no way they don't know something about it. Now, joining hundreds of other people in tourist activities is one thing, but being singled out and offered $10,000 to try their VIP maze sounds like a nightmare waiting to happen. The first thing to think about is the practicality of what he's just told us. The man explained that every season, they award their 10,000th visitor to try their VIP maze, but that that clearly means they've sectioned off dozens of acres of their property for one person's entertainment once a year. It doesn't make any economic sense, and when you add that to the fact that they're offering us $10,000 to finish it in two hours, this has got to be the most one-sided deal I've ever heard of. It's incredibly suspicious, and taking all this into account, we have to assume that these farmers are getting something else out of our participation that we don't realize. Now, the next big red flag here is that they aren't allowed to bring their phones, and if it were me, I would have gone back home just from this one detail. The truth is, for a simple family-oriented tourist spot, there isn't any reason they should be telling their customers to surrender their devices. If the group was thinking ahead, they'd realize that this is a huge corn maze of at least 100 acres, and it's extremely likely that they're going to get lost at some point. Having your phone with you might be the only way you'll be able to get some help, so if they're insisting on confiscating them, it's reasonable to assume they might have something to hide. There might be something in their maze they don't want us recording, and that's why if we were still interested in the cash prize, I would secretly insist to my friends that we lie, telling the farmers that we're detoxing from social media and left our phones at home today. Also, this is a small family business according to them, but by comparison, it's actually almost twice as big as the official largest corn maze in the world. This is a big deal, because having the bragging rights for the largest corn maze would be a huge boost in ticket sales, and the fact that it's not being advertised anywhere is extremely suspicious. What's even worse is that normally, cash prizes are used to drive as many customers as possible to your attraction, but for some reason, these farmers are doing the exact opposite. 
opposite. When they found out she was the 10,000th customer, they escorted the group way outside earshot from the public before explaining anything about her reward. It's almost like they're trying to hide something illegal. And when you factor in the VIP maze, it's clear we shouldn't be accepting this man's offer unless we find out everything about this place. Now, if you'd like to start your own little how to be kingdom, then established titles is going to be right up your alley. Purchase a title pack giving you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, along with an official crested certificate. Based on an old Scottish custom, this will give you the title Lord or Lady. You can officially include this title for use with a credit card, plane ticket, dating profiles, and more. It's especially great as a conversation starter about your favorite how to be video. Established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. With every order, a tree is planted around the world with help from global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. Established titles allows you to support global reforestation efforts along with the whole bag of goodies. The first 200 people to purchase a title pack with the link will be placed right next to my own plot of land so we can all be neighbors. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can create our little how to be kingdom. Established titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code how to beat, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash how to beat to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Thank you to established titles for sponsoring this video. The group gets inside the truck and Herschel speeds through the maze when he comes to a stop in front of some people dressed up like monsters. The owner tells the friends to shoot them with their guns and the group quickly pull the triggers, pelting them with paintballs before they drive off. They're all having a good time as they're taken to the start of the VIP maze, where the owner explains there are five unique ways to enter the corn maze, but some are longer than others. Melanie asks if they can split up and points out to her friends that they'll have a better chance of winning by covering more paths. The owner approves of her plan, making it clear they can go it alone or as a group, and that's when her brother asks if the cult story is true. Herschel insists it's made up and there's nothing shady going on here, but if the group is too scared, they can always try the normal maze. Melanie convinces the others to explore the VIP maze, reminding them it's easy money, and the group is all in. With that settled, the owner warns them not to take the middle path, insisting it's the longest. They agreed to take his advice, but Rustin here is still nervous, remembering the story about the cult. Frustrated, the owner points out that a child has finished this maze before, and the sister makes fun of him being scared. That makes the guy angry, and the brother challenges his friends to see who can finish first, heading out into the maze. Splitting up, the group goes their separate ways and leave the owner by himself, with no idea that they're walking straight into a death trap. Later, as Wendy is searching for the exit, a cloth ghost suddenly pops out of the cornfield and a staff member reveals himself. It's pretty lame compared to what the group went through earlier and keeps on going, determined to win the prize money. Meanwhile, Rustin is walking through the maze when he sees a masked figure pass by. It's the first scary thing he's seen here, and when the guy goes to see where he went, Rustin finds the path empty. He's about to double back, but finds the man standing still in the distance, and when he takes another look, the scarecrow is suddenly right in front of him. That takes him by surprise, and he tries to start a conversation with the staff member, but gets no response. Frustrated, he walks away, insulting the stranger as he continues looking for the exit. Okay, these people are making a huge mistake. They've just walked into the VIP corn maze and have all split up to make sure someone gets the shortest path. This way, if one of them can finish in under two hours, they'll get the $10,000 and share it between the four of them. It's a good strategy, but if the group was listening, they'd realize they were walking straight into a trap. First of all, I have to point out that this wasn't even their idea. The farmer told them there are five paths and that some of them are shorter than others. Splitting up to find the easiest way to make $10,000 is such an obvious strategy that we can't pretend the farmers didn't think of it first. They knew someone was going to say this, and that's extremely dangerous. If we have reason to believe that these people might be a family of Satan-worshipping cultists, the last thing we want is to be on our own for two hours and making predictable decisions for them to control us. The second thing to point out is that when Rustin here asked the man about the cult he read in the news, the man somehow didn't even address the question in his response. He literally sidestepped up the entire subject by telling them they're just a family farm and a 12-year-old girl could finish the maze in under two hours. For some reason, the group just accepted it as an answer to reassure their concerns, and it was a huge mistake. Anyone who is that diplomatic about a question this serious has had a lot of practice handling the subject, and it only gives us more reason to not trust his answers. The truth is, most large mazes require children to have adult supervision at all times, and only sell tickets to those 18 and up. The man is outright lying, and this is another red flag they really should have seen from miles away. Now, 
being randomly selected for a VIP cord maze and having our phones confiscated is already suspicious enough. So leaving any room for uncertainty on whether or not these farmers might sacrifice us to Satan is not something I'm willing to leave open-ended. That's why if it were me, I would make sure I knew the faces of every one of their family members before I agreed to play. The reason this would help is because if there's f***ed up activity happening on this secret section of the farm, then it's very unlikely they would be using hired help to manage this specific maze. That means any staff members we find in the maze, we would be able to immediately recognize if they're family or hired help, and this will be a huge clue as to whether or not our lives are in danger. If it turns out we've only seen family members inside the maze, it's a pretty good sign that this is about to get ugly, and we should pay special attention to make sure we keep track of their movements. Now, we still want to make sure we can finish this maze as quickly as possible. And while splitting up makes sense on the surface, it's actually not the smartest decision to make. Each maze will be difficult, and there's a lot of luck involved in picking the right direction, because making the wrong turn could end up with you spending way too much time retracing your steps. That's why if it were me, I would refuse to split up, and instead insist that all four of us go down the same direction, but every time we find a fork in the path, one person explores it while the rest of us continue. This strategy would be a lot more efficient, because if that person winds up in a dead end, the others have already been walking in the right direction, saving everyone time. The player that fell behind would be able to easily catch up, because his friends in front of him can leave markings to let him know which direction they walked in. Repeating this strategy is far more efficient than having everyone explore their own paths, and since we don't know if these farmers are dangerous or not, keeping safety in numbers is a much smarter idea. These kids are ignoring every single warning sign, and soon enough, it's going to get them killed. Later that day, Melanie heads up an elevated walkway and searches for the way out, but there's nothing. The girl can't even spot her friends, and she tries calling out to them, hoping they'll respond, but gets no answer. There's nobody nearby, and the group has failed to make it out, leaving them stuck until nightfall. In another part of the maze, Brandon here is walking along the path, when this blonde woman with a machete approaches them and starts hitting on the man. Ignoring her advances, he asks for directions to the exit, but the woman insists she can't give away any clues, and then suggests they have some fun together. She's practically throwing herself at Brandon, but he turns her down, insisting he's already taken. With her plan failing, the woman suddenly slashes his leg, and the man freaks out, demanding to know what's going on, but she only tells him to run away before she finishes counting to ten. Realizing his life is on the line, Brandon limps away as fast as he can, with no idea where to go, and that there's no escaping the fear farm. Meanwhile, Melanie is running through the maze when she sees a huge man holding a chainsaw in the distance. The girl is shocked by how scary he is, but she continues walking, thinking that it's all for show. Approaching the giant, Melanie reaches up to touch his mask to examine the prop and realizes the barbed wire on his head is real. He suddenly headbutts her, knocking the girl to the ground, and swings his chainsaw as she tries to escape. It's clear the man wants to hurt her, so Melanie pretends to surrender and secretly grabs her knife. But just as she flicks it out, the man kicks her over. The girl tries to grab it, but the man slams his chainsaw on the ground, blocking her from taking the weapon. It's terrifying, and the girl gets back to her feet, coming up with a plan to escape. She quickly rolls past the man to pick up her knife, slashing him in the leg, and kicking him before sprinting down the path. Melanie knows he's going to chase after her, and once she's out of his sight, hides deep in the cornrows. The girl can only hold her breath as the giant starts cutting down the stalks of his chainsaw, but he never spots her and quickly walks away, leaving the girl all by herself. Okay, our worst suspicions have officially come true. We've all split up, we have no phones, it's getting dark, and now there are serial killing farmers chasing us through hundreds of acres in a corn maze. When you see a man holding a live chainsaw with real teeth on it, then it's obvious the man is here not just to scare us, but to kill us. At this point, there's no question that we need to get the f*** out of here, but instead, this girl decided to walk right up to the man and touch his mask. It's incredibly stupid, and if it were me, I would have been spooked out enough to start running in the opposite direction, keeping my eye on him until he turned the corner. Now, anytime you're facing another person, the smartest thing to do is size up the threat and evaluate what their weaknesses are. Even when everything is telling you that you're in over your head, there's always something that you can take advantage of. In this case, this man is very large, muscular, and is wielding a heavy chainsaw. This makes him much slower than us, and it needs to be the first thing we use against him. He's also wearing a full mask with very narrow eye slits, which severely compromises his vision, and this will help us hide from him when we need to. With this in mind, once I've turned the corner and I'm clear of his eye line, I would start sprinting down the adjacent path at full speed before dipping into the cornfields. By the time this giant chainsaw man turns the corner, we'll be gone, and with his mask limiting his vision, it will be difficult for him to look for tracks to figure out where I went. From there, we can make our way slowly through the thicket of the corn towards the edge of the maze, and 
without our phones. We'll have to use the moon to figure out which direction to walk in. What's interesting is that since the moon reflects the sun's light, its bright side will always indicate where the sun is. Now, we already know we're in the northern hemisphere, so if you draw a line between the sharp points on a crescent moon and then continue the line down towards the Earth, then this point on the horizon indicates south. The reason this helps us find the edge of the maze is because we should be able to recall what cardinal direction we needed to travel in to get here. For example, if we know that we traveled north to reach the farm and made a right turn into the parking lot, then we know our car is east, and by inference, the moon can tell us which direction to walk in. In another part of the maze, Brandon continues trying to escape the psychotic woman, but she quickly catches up and pulls a syringe out of her boot. The man suddenly finds his way blocked by the giant, and he tries to turn back, but the crazy blonde jumps on him, knocking Brandon out. With her victim captured, she confronts the chainsaw-wielding maniac and demands to know why he isn't chasing down his target. Reluctantly, the giant explains to his sister he lost track of Melanie, and that makes her furious. But noticing how upset he is, she apologizes to her brother, telling the man to take Brandon back to the lab. She'll hunt down Melanie for him and runs off the track the girl down. Meanwhile, Rustin is walking through the maze when he hears someone behind him and realizes a guy dressed like a ghost has followed him. The man tries joking around with the staff member, but the stranger doesn't react. No matter what he does, Rustin can't make the actor break character, so the man asks him to call up his boss and pick them up, but the stranger walks away into the cornfield. It's annoying as hell, and with no other options, the man continues through the maze with no idea he's heading right into a trap. Walking down the path, he spots a scarecrow in the distance and decides to have some fun. He picks picks up an orange and throws the fruit straight at the prop, managing to hit his target. Satisfied, Rustin heads through the maze and never notices the scarecrow drop down from its stand. It's actually a staff member, and the man spots another one in the distance, but just as he's about to throw something at it, someone cuts off his arm. It takes Rustin by surprise, and he turns around realizing that he's been attacked by a staff member. Shocked, he tries to run away from him, but then the second person dressed as a scarecrow steps out of the cornfield. He's cut off on both sides and collapsed to the ground from blood loss. Suddenly, a car revs its engine in the distance, and the two killers walk towards it, signaling to the driver they've got a victim. They don't know that Melanie has come out of hiding and rushes over to her brother, insisting they need to get out of here, but Rustin doesn't think he'll survive. Reaching his limit, the man falls face first on the ground and goes still. The girl is horrified that he's died, only for her brother to reveal that he's just joking and only pretending to die. It's a waste of valuable time, and before they can escape, the sister is tackled by one of the scarecrows. She struggles to fight him off as her brother crawls away, determined to hijack the car, but as he stands up, the driver runs him over with the truck, making that one victim down with three more to go. Horrified, Melanie quickly takes out her knife and jams it into the scarecrow's neck, killing him before he can react. With the other murderous scarecrow heading towards her, the girl runs off, hoping that she can find the exit. Meanwhile, in another part of the farm, the college student wakes up restrained to a hospital bed and sees the psychotic woman lathering his legs with a cream. It's creepy as hell, and he demands to know what's going on, but the woman walks away to pick up a strange tool. She explains that this is a dermatome, and it's what they use to carve the skin off of the fear farm's victims. Okay, this is terrifying. Brandon here has been kidnapped so that this family of corn farmers can take flesh from his body and his friends are being attacked by masked murderers. If they don't escape soon, they'll all be killed. But if Rustin here wasn't being a complete idiot, he might have had a better chance of surviving. When he encountered the first farmer in the maze, he started antagonizing the guy for not breaking character. And for someone who was too afraid to come here from rumors of a cult incident 15 years ago, this is a very dumb thing to do. Before that, when they were in the truck, he kept taking crotch shots at everyone with the paint gun, and it's only giving them good reason to want the kid dead. He even threw fruit at the scarecrows, so it's not an accident he was the first person to be killed, but there's actually a valuable lesson to learn here. When your life is in danger, don't be a dick, because it doesn't help your odds of survival. With all this in mind, Rustin should have easily come to the conclusion that somebody in this maze will want to get revenge on him. Farming communities can be very close-knit, and if I was walking through a giant corn maze at night with no way to call for help, I'd be worried someone will take the opportunity to attack me. That's why I would have kept my head on a swivel, listened closely, and used a technique taught to survivalists and the FBI known as Owl Eyes. This is a technique used for scanning large amounts of information at once to look for threats, targets, and resources. Best of all, this is incredibly easy to apply and actually makes you faster to respond to visual information. All you need to do to unlock this ability is to go outside where you can see the horizon and bring your hands together in front of you before slowly pulling them apart. Then, focus on everything visible between your hands until you reach the edge of your peripheral vision. This 
can be practiced while walking around, helping you to notice small changes in the environment and react to them quickly. While it might sound simple, it's actually helped hunters find their prey and evade predators for thousands of years, and it's exactly what he needed to avoid losing an arm. If he had seen this giant coming, there's a good chance he'd still have an arm and come up with a plan to escape. If I saw him coming before he chopped my arm off, I'd jump back, get low, and throw sand in his eyes. His size is going to make him a lot more vulnerable to fatigue, so if we can wear him down and get his machete, then we have a much better chance of surviving the night. The woman decides to give him a live demonstration, and he screams in pain as she cuts off a piece of flesh from his leg. It's agonizing, and she makes it clear that all of his skin is going to be carved from his body. Desperate, the man begs her to let him go, but she stuffs a rag into his mouth to keep him quiet. She continues to operate, taking more of his flesh, until he suddenly passes out from the pain, making that two victims down with two more to go. That's when the other staff members enter the room and wheel in the scarecrow, begging the woman to help treat his wounds. Inspecting the body, she points out the man is dead and there's nothing they can do to help. Frustrated, the woman demands to know which of the staff members are still in the field, and the killers explain that one is hunting down the sister Melody, while the other is looking for Brandon's girlfriend. Mean Meanwhile, the cheerleader is heading through the maze when she finds a clown standing beside an ice cream truck. It's creepy as hell, and the woman questions how long the group has been here. Checking his phone, the man reveals they've all been in the maze for over an hour and 20 minutes, meaning they've lost the chance to win $10,000. Frustrated, Wendy asks if any of her friends have reached the finish line, but the clown reveals that a bell will ring once that happens, and it hasn't rung all night. That's when he offers her a free treat, and his friend pops out, listing the items on their menu, but the girl refuses their offer. They're acting way too weird. And Wanting to at least get the $5,000 for completing the maze in two hours, she continues on her way. Wendy tries telling them she'd like one later, but there's nobody standing by the truck. Suddenly, the clown sneaks up behind her and hooks his catch pull around her neck, tightening the rope until it squeezes her throat. He pulls the girl towards them as she struggles for breath, but the cheerleader pushes them away and quickly takes the catch pull off her neck. She brutally smacks him in the face with it and runs for the exit as fast as she can, but she'll never leave this place alive. Okay, this is getting bad. Two people have already died. The survivors don't know where the others are. Nobody has made it out of here to get help, and they can't call the police. This means our only option is to escape this place on our own. But if Wendy here had been paying attention, she might have been able to use the situation to her advantage. Now, first of all, we have to appreciate this clown's mad skills. He might have had the world's quietest clown shoes, but the fact that he went around and was able to cover at least 10 meters so quickly without her seeing or hearing him is a really impressive feat. One thing that people often take for granted, however, However, is that as peaceful as this environment might look, corn is actually a really loud crop. Even with a small breeze, it creates enough rustling in the corn stalks to easily cover up the sound of footsteps. With this in mind, the cheerleader really should have been paying much closer attention to her surroundings because a man that behaves like this is not someone you want to turn your back on. We need to figure out how to use everything we have available to us as a weapon. That's why if it were me, as soon as the rope was around my neck, I would jump up and wrap my legs around the pole as close to the base as possible. By the way he's holding it, there's a very low likelihood that he would be able to support my body's weight, and he might be forced to drop the pole. If we can wrestle it from his grip and pull it away, the other farmer will leave the truck to offer support. This is our perfect opportunity now, because that means there's an empty ice cream truck, and since the lights are on, that means the keys should be in the ignition. If we can lure both of them into the corn, we could take this opportunity to dash into the vehicle and start the engine, making sure to use the pole to keep them from following us inside. Now, this is obviously an ambitious strategy, but the good news is that there's a quick backup plan. If we can't lose their trail, we can still enter the vehicle quickly enough to see if one of them might have left their phone inside and take their keys so that they can't run us down. We don't need their passwords to call emergency services, and as long as we can make the call, it's going to increase our chances of survival massively. As for Brandon, he's committed a series of bad decisions that have led him into a situation where there really isn't any counter move for him to take. At the very least, he could have stalled for a lot longer if he mirrored the last few words the woman said back to her with an upwards inflection. This is a technique known as mirroring that Chris Voss, the former head hostage hostage negotiator for the FBI has frequently used, and it causes people to elaborate on what they just said without them even thinking about it. It sounds simple, but this tactic is surprisingly effective, and when used to gain more information from people, they'll reveal details that we can use against them. If Brandon had applied this technique to get information and stalled for as long as possible, there's a slim but real chance he could have been found and rescued. Wendy continues through the maze as the ice cream truck chases after her, but it's getting closer, and it's only a matter of time before it runs her over. Acting quickly, the girl takes a left turn and manages to avoid the vehicle. She runs out of her hiding place and tries to head back, but gets distracted when her friend Melanie steps out of the cornfield, noticing something behind her. The cheerleader turns around and gets shot in the leg with a harpoon, and the clowns drive off into the distance, dragging the girl away to be skinned alive. Melanie follows the vehicle in secret, determined to rescue her friend, and tracks it down to these silent
silos. The girl sneaks inside the building, finding this strange warehouse, and overhears some doctors talking about harvesting something from donors. The girl doesn't understand what's going on and continues to look around, desperate to find her friends. Stepping out of sight, she bumps into a strange hanging bag and realizes there's a body wrapped inside. Whatever is happening here requires human victims, and Melanie backs away, making sure to keep an eye out for any guards, but that was her biggest mistake. She bumps straight into the masked giant and he picks the girl up by her neck, strangling her until she finally blacks out. Later, Melanie wakes up tied to a wheelchair and notices her friend Wendy is strapped to a medical table, but is horrified to see her skin has been brutally carved off. It's scary as hell, and she apologizes for insisting they come here, terrified of what's going to happen next. Melanie insists they'll make it out of the farm alive, but that's when the owner, Herschel, enters the room, with his family of killers following him. The girl struggles to break out of her restraints, as the man reveals they've been looking for someone like her for 15 years, but he makes it clear he's furious she murdered his son. He would kill her, but they still need Melanie for a special reason, and that's when he asks his daughter if they still need Wendy. The woman reassures him he can get rid of her, and the girls beg him to spare her, but the man walks over to the blonde, viciously stabbing her to death. That makes three victims down, with only one more to go. Furious, Melanie swears to get revenge on the owner and demands to know why they're doing this to them. The daughter reluctantly explains that the stamp given to the customers is secretly designed to detect if someone has a special gene, and since all of her friends have it, the family lured them into the VIP maze to harvest their skin. They then turn the flesh into a face cream that totally stops the aging process and sell it for cash. But what makes Melanie so special is that she has the highest amount of this gene that they've ever seen. Okay, this is insane. These farmers just explained that they've been secretly harvesting people's skin every year to make a special beauty cream, and if it wasn't such a horrifying situation, I would probably laugh in their faces. It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life, but Melanie here could have saved herself from listening to this nonsense if she had made a few better decisions. First of all, heading inside an unknown building with zero information is a stupid idea. For all she knew, there could have been 10 goons with weapons who would have instantly killed Melanie as soon as she walked in. If the girl was thinking clearly, she should have scattered around the building before heading inside and collected as much information as she could. All she would need to do is peek through any windows or carefully listen through the walls to check if there was activity on the other side and figure out the safest way to enter. If it were me, as soon as the coast is clear, instead of sneaking around to look for my friends, I would have looked for a weapon. With something to protect myself, I'd be a lot safer investigating each room and carefully checking around corners to avoid detection. Now having said that, it's worth pointing out that if these farmers are smart enough to identify a gene with hand stamps, develop a literal anti-aging serum, and kill someone every harvest season for 15 years straight without getting caught, they could be a lot better off than managing a corn farm. What's even more hilarious is that this woman told us she has a PhD in biotechnology, and with this kind of talent, she should have figured out a way to grow skin using our stem cells in a lab instead of harvesting them. Now, it's fair to point out they might not have the resources to set up this kind of laboratory, but even still, this wasn't their only option. These people are already full-blown serial killers, so if they were thinking straight, it would have been much more profitable to have joined a crime ring in a country with far less rule of law and gone insanely rich from their breakthrough technology. This evil family has a lot of talent with no imagination for big picture thinking, but the good news is that this is exactly what we can use against them to keep ourselves alive. Since they know that our genes are what makes us special, I would tell them that I come from a huge family who all share my genetic makeup and would be willing to sell them all out to have their skin harvested if they let me escape. It would obviously be a lie, but as terrible as it sounds, the benefit here is that if we appeal to their greed, we can push these farmers out of their comfort zone and force them to take illegal activities outside of their property. This massively increases their chances of getting caught by the police because they'll be exposed to security cameras, neighborhood watch, Watches and won't be able to confiscate anyone's phones to protect themselves. It also guarantees that we'll be kept alive for as long as possible, because they'll expect us to speak to our family members, assuring them that these people can be trusted. As long as we are offering something they want desperately enough to kill for, there's a very good chance they'll walk right into our trap and get themselves exposed. She's going to be their new cash cow, and the family needs to keep her alive to harvest more of her flesh, but they have no idea that Melanie is unwrapping her hands free. Suddenly, she gets up, pushing the psychotic woman away, and quickly picks up her knife. Seeing the girl threatening them, the owner laughs her off and he reminds the girl that even if she manages to escape them, she'll be stuck in a 100-acre corn maze. One month later, Brandon's mother walks around a farmer's market and hands out flyers in search of her missing son. Approaching one of the stalls, she asks the vendors if they've seen him, but the woman has no idea she's talking to the people who murdered him. Herschel lies, telling the woman they've never seen him before, and the mom turns to leave, but the daughter stops her. She offers the older woman some face cream to clear up her skin, and the mother wipes it onto her face with no idea it was 
harvested from her son. Back in the lab, Melanie suddenly wakes up in a bed, and she's still alive, but unable to speak. The family has been harvesting the girl for her skin, and the owner's daughter walks into the room, surprised to see she's awake. The woman makes it clear that they'll continue to use her, and hooks up some sedative to put the survivor into a medically induced coma. It's horrifying for the girl, but she's learned a valuable lesson. Corn mazes are overrated. But what do you think? How would you be fear for Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.